Guten Tag, WAF. This is Mr. Linegar. Let's make history today as we go over Unit 4, Day 11. The next two days, we're going to talk about Europe, Western and Eastern, specifically during the Cold War. But let's get started with our daily punishment. Why was the baby ant confused? Because all of its uncles were ants. <laughs> Your key terms for today, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the two alliance systems, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, the Berlin Airlift, the Berlin Wall, Welfare State, the European Union, New Feminism, the Alt-Right, Far-Right, and Brexit. We're going to go over the causes and progression of the Cold War and life in Western Europe during the Cold War. So let's get started. The Cold War is going to start with a couple of events. The Cold War is a period of tension between America and Communist Russia, really for dominance of the world. They're the two major superpowers after World War II. It's as much an ideological dispute over anything. America is capitalist. They are democratic. Russia is communist. They have a command economy. They are totalitarian. They're going to be fighting for influence over different countries and it's going to be a 50 something year war from 1947 to 1990, 1991. America and Russia will not fight directly. That's why it's called the Cold War, but they will be fighting uh, indirectly in proxy war in third world countries. So let's start about why it happened. The first thing was the Yalta Conference. The Yalta Conference was during World War II. Um, Franklin Roosevelt is going to basically give uh, Stalin control over Eastern Europe, over Poland. In return, Stalin is going to promise to allow those countries to have free elections. He is going to renege on those promises. When he takes over those lands during World War II, he's going to force them to become communist. America during this time was very paranoid about appeasement because we had appeased Hitler uh, before World War II. And this is going to make some Americans think that Stalin was going to become the next Hitler, that he was just taking over land. The Russians were angry at America over World War II because we had not uh, got, we waited till 1944 to invade France. So up until 1944, Russia was basically on their own to fighting uh, Nazi Germany. That's one of the reasons they took over parts of Eastern Europe is they wanted to have a buffer state away from Germany. Also a big dispute is ideology. The post-war territorial divisions are gonna reflect the growing schism between America and Russia. The Soviets will take East Germany, while the Western allies will take West Germany. Germany is going to be divided between West, which is non-communist, and Eastern Germany, which is communist. Berlin also was the capital of Germany. And even though Berlin was in East Germany, Berlin itself will be divided between West and East. West will be non-communist. East will be communist. Winston Churchill makes a speech here. He says there's an iron current that's gone over Europe separating West and East, and that's very symbolic as a metaphor for what happens during the Cold War. In 1947, Harry Truman was worried. Uh, Greece and Turkey were both having communist rebellions. Eastern Europe had just gone communist, and he was afraid that uh, the Soviets were trying to take over the world. So he uh, makes a speech to Congress and passes something called the Truman Doctrine, which Congress will support. It says that America would give free people resisting subjugation uh, they would support them. They would give them military and economic aid. So we're going to start to become more interventionist. We want to contain communism. We want to stop communism from spreading where it's not already. We can't really do anything for where communism already is, but we want to stop the spread of communism. So we'll give weapons, uh, military training, economic aid to countries that are having communist revolutions. And we start doing this in Greece and Turkey. In 1948, America passes the Marshall Plan which gives tens of millions of dollars to aid to help the recovery of Europe. Europe was pretty crushed from World War II. Even the countries that won, they're in economic straits. And some of those countries were flirting with communism. The best way to turn countries away from communism is helping to improve their economy. So America's going to give aid, uh, economic aid, money uh, to countries uh, after World War II to help stabilize them. And this will be very successful. By the 1940s, 1950s, there was two alliance systems. There was the non-communist alliance system, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and there was the communist alliance, which was Russia and Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact. 
and you can see the align system right here. Really, the world's been divided into two sides. And you see like a lot of the third world countries also uh, have chosen to be allied with one or more of, with one or more of the sides, with either NATO or the Warsaw Pact. There were some events that happened in the Cold War. In uh, 1949, Germany was officially divided east and west. So was Berlin. What you're going to see here is uh, Joseph Stalin. You can see Berlin is right here. Joseph Stalin wanted all of Berlin to be uh, part of the Soviet Union. So he's going to do a blockade on Berlin. Before this time, he was allowing Americans to use the roads to give uh, like food and resources to Berlin because Berlin was bombed during World War II and they, they needed resources to survive. He thought if he did a blockade in Berlin, then Western Berlin would have to surrender and he would have all of Berlin. What America is going to do during this time is they're going to do an airlift where they're going to use helicopters, actually airplanes, to drop food and supplies into Western Berlin uh, over international air to feed Berlin. Stalin's eventually going to give up in 1950 and allow the Americans to use the roads again to feed and support Berlin. In 1961, what's going to happen is the Russians are going to build a wall through Berlin. What was happening again is the Western Germany, the non-communists, had a much higher standard of living, living than Eastern Germany. So a lot of people were in, that were in Berlin, they were just, uh, in order to get to the non-communist area, they were just going to the western part of Berlin. So a lot of people were leaving the communist area. In order to prevent the people from leaving the communist area, they're going to build a wall uh, through Berlin called the Berlin Wall. And the Berlin Wall becomes symbolic of the Cold War. Also, what's going to happen is there will be a nuclear arms race during this time. Russia is going to build an atomic bomb uh, by the late 1940s, early 1950s. America builds a hydrogen bomb by like 50, 51. Russia's going to build one six months later. Um, America will build a nuclear bomb. Russia will build one. We'll build a, a better nuclear bomb, the hydrogen bomb. Russia will build it, and we're going to do an arms race. Both of us will start building more and more nuclear weapons. Uh, America and Russia are not going to fight directly because if we do and it leads to a nuclear war, it could destroy the world. That whole doctrine is called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. America and Russia won't fight directly against each other because it could end, lead to the end of the world. Let's talk about the governmental structure in Western Europe after World War II. America and their allies are going to be uh, are going to support Western Europe. There will be a permanent presence of an American army. These countries will all be liberal democracies. They'll all have the welfare state, uh, where they will have governmental programs to help the poor like social security, free, uh, free universities, free colleges, uh, universal health care. European politics will shift to the left. They still will be capitalist, but there will be more government involvement to help the poor. Uh, European countries will become closer together, and this will lead to the EEC, the European Economic Communities. It will be like free trade area between some European countries. This will be the prototype of the European Union which will come into being in the 1970s, 1980s. This will include a common parliament, currency union, free navigation amongst people in the European Union. There will be economic expansion in, world, in Western Europe after World War II. The Marshall Plan will help to create an economic boom. Let's talk about some specific countries. The U United Kingdom is gonna go through decolonization after World War II. They're going to free a lot of their colonies. They free India in 1949. Uh, their African countries will be freed in the 1950s and 60s. They're going to become, uh, throughout my, most, most of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there'll be labor governments, so the government will get in, more involved. They will get uh, universal health care in England. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher, who is a conservative, will be elected prime minister. She's going to try to relax parts of the welfare state and do deregulation and more power for private corporations. Let's talk about West Germany. Under the US, French and Britain, uh, West Germany is gonna be integrated into Europe to avoid future wars. West Germany will eventually become part of NATO. They'll have a strong economic recovery after 1949 called the German miracle, 
where we'll build a lot of cars, electronics, consumer goods. It will build also a social market economy, mixing capitalism and welfare socialism. By 1989, the European Union included United Kingdom, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. By 20, 2005, it had a lot more countries at a common parliament, passport, trade policies, currency, and a central bank. But this rise towards globalization is not going to go unchecked. There is going to be a far-right reaction, which has happened within the last couple of years. This developed after World War II. Some of the common beliefs in the far right in Europe are extreme nationalism, very populistic with a common man. Not necessarily like, you know, super capitalism, but very populist, you know, very like appealing to poor people. Very anti-immigrant, blaming the immigrants for people losing jobs. Very anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic. Very theocratic, you know, usually mixing like Christianity with their beliefs. Racist, uh, kind of like, you know, putting down and blaming minorities for everything. Anti-globalization against the European Union, against multiculturalism. Some of these far-right beliefs are influenced by Nazism. Some of the examples of the far-right parties is you have the Freedom Party of Austria, UKIP in England, which was against, uh, which was against the European Union. It was for Brexit. The National Rally Party in France and the Alternative for Germany in Germany. These parties have started to do much better in elections within the last 20 years. The alt-right is a far-right ideology in America that rejects mainstream politics and nudes. It's very radical and racist. The alt-right is its view on race, religion, and gender, and sexual orientation. The alt-right has become a bigger deal in American politics. It's gone from the fringes to more mainstream uh, since 2016. One of the big events that's happened in the world was Brexit. This was when uh, Britain had a vote and they decided to leave the European Union, British exit, Brexit. They, uh, this happened in 2016, just uh, within like the last couple years, 2021, they finally made plans of leaving the uh, United Kingdom. Brexit barely passed. There has been some effort to try to get back into it, uh, to try to get back into European Union, but that has not been successful. And Britain has left the European Union. They blame the European Union for British people losing their jobs, for trade policies. Uh, they use nationalism and kind of anti-immigrant beliefs to support Brexit. This shows the European Union. Obviously, Britain's not there anymore, so that little island Britain is not true. As far as other countries in the Western world, a lot of the former dominions that used to be part of Britain are going to get independence after World War II. They all became liberal de uh, democracies and welfare states. They all become aligned with America and NATO. Let's talk about some of the specific countries. Canada is going to join America and Mexico and the North Atlantic Free Trade Organization, NAFTA, which is a free trade treaty in the countries in North America. There has been some internal disputes in uh, Canada with Quebec, which is a region there, because they used to be part of France, uh, where some people in Quebec want their independence. Australia has been a strong U.S. ally. Australia in the 1950s and 60s did have racial problems. Originally, they adopted an all-white immigration policy. They finally got rid of that in the 1960s. The 20th century has been an American century. From 1914 onwards, America has dominated the world stage. We've dominated the economics. Uh, we've been the most powerful economic power and the most powerful military power. And really, we've pushed foreign policy, the United States has, with things like the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and little proxy wars America has gotten involved in, like the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Let's talk about some of the cultural changes. There's been dramatic changes in gender after World War II. After World War I, most women got the right to vote, but after World War II, women are gonna get the right to vote and they're gonna enter politics. Women will start to delay marriage and uh, children, you know, so they can actually go to work. There'll be an increase in birth control. Birth control will become legal. Uh, abortions will become legal, especially like in America in the 1970s with Roe v. Wade. 
divorces will increase. This is called the second wave of feminism or new feminism. This is different from the first wave of feminism, which was about the right to vote. The second wave of feminism is more about like uh, literal and legal equality, like having equal pay, uh, having literal uh, equality. Like, you know, if there's a divorce, women get the child also. Like they have just as much, just much right to get the child. They're treated equal with men because they were not treated equal with men before. Obviously, the second wave of feminism has not been fully successful. Women still get paid less than men for the same job. Some of the big books that really pushed for new feminism were The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir and The Feminism Mystique. Uh, right now, we're in the third wave of feminism. That's like the whole Me Too movement. But the second wave of feminism in the 1960s and 70s is going to get a lot of those more uh, legal equality things to develop. Uh, not fully, especially like there's still a huge economic wage gap between men and women, but it is going to be better than it was. Western culture is going to become more liberal during this time. Um, it's going to expand access to education for universities. More people are going to go to college. There's going to be more expression in arts and culture to challenge tra traditional approaches. You get things like pop art. Sexual experimentation will become increasingly, which will lead to sex before marriage. You'll have the sex revolution in the 1960s. You have new types of music like rock and roll. Uh, culture will become more secular. Less and less people will go to church during this time. Uh, more people still go to church in America than other Western nations. But even in America, it's not that much. It's around like a little bit less than 50%. But society will become more secular during this time. All right, guys. That's all I have for you for today. Until next time. D -d -d deuces, deuces, deuces.